welcome back to our learning course. In this lesson, we will continue our theme of animals as naive detectives and look at another important variable in learning. This concerns the difference between a stimulus being contiguous with another versus contingent upon another. Let's look first at the dictionary definition of these two words, contiguous and contingent. As most words, a dictionary will list a bunch of meanings for each. The way psychologists use the word contiguous is meaning number three in this list, which is from the online edition of the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. In Pavlovian conditioning, for example, we say that the U.S. is contiguous to the C.S. if it closely follows it in time. The second word, contingent, is a bit trickier. Its meaning in psychology is closest to the first meaning here. We say that the U.S. is contingent upon the C.S., if there is a correlation between CS occurrence and US occurrence. Let's see what this means with the help of some pictures. I will show you three different ways in which the CS and US can be arranged in time. This would be for a Pavlovian conditioning experiment, but we will later see that it also works for instrumental conditioning. Then we will try to guess what an animal would learn in each case. In the next slide, we'll see what animals actually learn. The first case is that of a so-called positive contingency between CS and US. This means that when the CS happens, the US is also likely to happen, and that the CS does not happen without the CS. For example, in this timeline, we see that the US occurs always right after the CS. If the animal can learn this, it will be able to predict exactly when the US occurs from observing the CS. In addition, the animal would be sure that the US never occurs on its own. If we want a mathematical expression of all this, we can say that the probability of the US, given that the CS has just occurred, is higher than the probability of the US without the CS having occurred. In the formula, PR means probability, and the vertical bar means given, as in probability of the US given that the CS has occurred or given that the CS has not occurred, as in the second expression. Let's now look at the case of so-called negative contingency. In a negative contingency, the US is more likely to occur without the CS than with it. This example shows a very strong negative contingency, such that when we see the CS, we are sure that the US will not occur for some time. Now, in these two cases, it is kind of easy to guess what an animal would learn. In the case of a positive contingency, we should see a CR, a conditioned response, being learned to the CS. In the case of a negative contingency, there should be no CR, or maybe a CR that is appropriate to the absence of the US rather than to its presence. For example, if the US is a shock, the CS would actually be a safety signal when the CS-US contingency is negative, not a danger signal. If the animal learns this, we should see the CS induce signs of relaxation, for example, like a decreased heart rate. Let's now see a third example, which is trickier. The timeline has the same CS-US pairings as the first example, but in addition, there is an equal number of US's occurring without the CS. We say in this case that the contingency between the CS and US is zero. This means that the US is equally likely to occur with or without the CS. Now we are not quite sure about what an animal would learn. If they can learn the full contingency, they should not learn any CR to the CS because the CS actually provides no information about the US. But if the animals learn simply based on the US following the CS, that is based on contiguity rather than contingency, then they should learn in this case as much as they learned in the first case because the number of CS-US pairings is the same. Now we are ready to see what animals actually learn depending on the CS-US contingency. We look at the landmark experiment by Roscorla. This is a sphere conditioning experiment. You can look at the lesson about Pavlovian preparations for details about this procedure. In short, the rats were trained to press a lever for food, and then a sound shock contingency was introduced. Learning of this contingency was measured by how much the sound could suppress lever pressing. What Roscorla did that is interesting to us now is that he ran different groups of rats with different CSUS contingencies. He used 10 different ones, but we'll look at four for brevity. In all four, the probability of the US after the CS was 
That means that rats were shocked 40% of the time after the sound. The probability of a shock coming unannounced by the sound varied between 0 and 0 0.4 across the four groups. So for some rats, the shock was always signaled by the CS, while for others, shocks occurred also without the CS. These are the results. The measure percent suppression indicates how much the rats stopped pressing the lever while the sound was playing. 100% means that they stopped completely. 0% that they continued pressing as much as before. This measure is explained in detail in the lesson on blocking and overexpectation, but what we really need to know is that a higher value means more learning. So, let's start from the first point here. We see that it is from rats that were shocked 40% of the time after the CS, but that never received the shock without the CS. We can see this because the probability of the US without the CS is zero. These rats show the suppression percentage of 100% or nearly 100%, meaning that they stopped eating almost completely during the CS. And this in turn means that they became very afraid of it. So in the case of a strong positive contingency, things went as expected the rats learn to be afraid of a sound that announced a shock. The next two points are still from positive contingencies, but smaller ones, because the US sometimes occurred without the CS. In one case, there was a 10% probability, and in the other case, a 20% probability. In these cases, the rats became afraid of the CS, but less than before, as evidenced by the fact that the CS could not completely suppress lever pressing. We had about 50% suppression, and here about uh, 20 or 30% suppression. The last point is the crucial one. These rats were shocked equally often with and without the CS. So the CS was not a reliable signal of the shock. We can see that these rats continued eating undisturbed by the CS, meaning that they were not afraid of it. The suppression percentage is almost 0%. This result is crucial because it refers to the zero contingency explained in the previous slide. These rats were shocked after the CS as much as all of the other rats that learned something, but they did not learn any connection between the CS and the US. This is a great demonstration that the animals do not learn simply based on things happening close in time, contiguity, but they can actually take into account whether a stimulus provides useful information about the US. Rescorrelous example was about Pavlovian conditioning. What about contiguity and contingency in instrumental conditioning? It turns out things work pretty much in the same way. But in instrumental conditioning, we are looking at the relationship between an action and its outcome. Hammond ran an illustrative experiment. Rats were first trained to press the lever for food under the positive contingency. That is, food was delivered only if they pressed the lever, and each press had a 5% probability to result in food. On average, the rat had to press 20 times for each food delivery. These are the results. We see from the first part of the graph in red that they learned as expected, pressing thousands of times per hour. After a few days, Hammond switched the rats to a zero contingency. Lever presses were still rewarded with 5% probability, but in addition, food was also delivered without pressing with the same probability. The result was that the rats stopped pressing the lever almost completely over the course of a few days. This is the second part of the graph in black. To show that rats continued to pay attention to the contingency, Hammond switched them back to positive contingency and then again to a zero contingency. In both cases, the rats learned to behave appropriately, pressing when this was necessary to get food and stopping when they could get free food at the same rate. In summary, we learned that animals do not pay attention only to whether events are close to each other in time, but also to whether they are actually informative about what is going to happen. That is, they learn according to contingency rather than contiguity, and this, as a rule, is true in both Pavlovian and instrumental conditioning. The lessons on overshadowing, blocking and overexpectation, and condition inhibition continue to explore the theme of animals as naive detectives. Lessons on the Roscola-Wagner model we show an explanation of the effect of contingency. The lesson on auto-shaping and the one on genetic guidance of learning will discuss some exceptions to the results we have seen in this lesson. This lesson is over. Happy learning to everyone!